The bio of Francis Bacon is filled with bizarre anecdotes about him trying on women's clothing when he was a kid. There was a film in 1998 that featured his relationship with a burglar named George Dyer who fell through his studio skylight into his home studio and he became lovers with the guy. The guy who played James Bond in that film plays Francis Bacon's lover. Elements of this film and his biography are very surreal. However, when they first started exhibiting his work, at one point, he was rejected from one exhibit for not being surreal enough in his art. Again, context is everything, and Francis Bacon can be linked to other art giants of the 20th century, such as Lucian Freud and other surrealists. The fact that he came from the upper crust of English society probably didn't hurt his career at all. And as an upper class, educated white male, although many biographies insist he didn't have much education as a child because he was asthmatic, he was homeschooled, his position in wealthy English society during the 30s and 40s, Bacon had access to art history, design schools, his formal education more or less Uh, was an interior designer and a furniture designer. I'm sure his education provided him with enough info that he could in some ways see the art of art history and incorporate these ideas from earlier periods into his work later on. Probably uh, one of the biggest influences on him were the earliest surrealist movement of Dada, However, it's clear his knowledge of art history and such figures like Rembrandt and Edvard Munch are clearly referenced in his work. So Francis Bacon is clearly the heir to a long, continuous line of European artists who reference art history, and they reappropriate ideas from earlier periods. In the same way that some pop musicians sample earlier works and incorporate things like bass lines and uh, musical themes into their compositions. Bacon borrowed from Velazquez. He also borrowed from Edvard Munch and Rembrandt. Almost a kind of a math equation in which Velazquez plus Rembrandt equals a Francis Bacon painting. If you were to describe his work in terms of the formal or physical qualities, probably one of the more interesting and important elements in his work is that he paints on the reverse side of the canvas. He referred to it as the wrong side. It's the raw side. I learned this by watching a documentary vid about him, and he described part of his process. Um, He explained that one day he had run out of canvases, so he flipped a canvas to the raw side that was the unprimed, unfinished side. And he liked how indelible the mark was, how impermanent, how permanent it was. And so he continued to work on the reverse or raw side of the canvas. Today, this has caused a lot of problems for conservators and museums uh, because the oil paint interacts with open weave cotton or linen canvas and it rots it. And the paint literally that's adhering to it is rotting the base that it's attached to. That's one of the reasons why artists use gesso or prepare the canvas with something that will isolate the paint from the canvas itself. It keeps it from interacting. And so one of the things that is a problem about Bacon's paintings is that they deteriorate over time. Um, But also, it's important to know that Bacon is part of the um, early 20th century into the mid 20th century where artists started to just experiment with materials. The color in Bacon's paintings are probably influenced by Edvard Munch's paintings and also from other expressionist painters like Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. And the color is often kind of straight from the tube. It's applied in a non-local, highly saturated way, just pure, straight out of the tube, no modulation. The colors and the randomness of his choices are very different from the ideas that you see in Impressionist painters that use cool and warm relationships to depict space and light. 
uh, even though the impressionists sometimes use non-local color. The paint texture of these reverse canvases is often very thin with some areas of thick paint called impostos. More important uh, and more notable is the fact that he uses straight geometric lines and forms uh, for example, in his study after Velazquez's portrait, not only does Bacon smear the paint in long vertical lines, he also does similar things to the face in which he, fear, he smears the face in vertical stripes. He surrounds the figure with cartoon-like motion lines at the base of the figure, and it gives the overall composition a sense of flaring from the bottom and moving up towards the top in kind of an explosive way. The yellow diagonal and almost horizontal lines surrounding the throne are references to the throne that um, Velazquez's uh, portrait of the Pope sits on. But he also uses similar forms and arrows like this in his other paintings. And some historians have interpreted this as being a, taken from his early training as a designer. Francis Bacon is not really interested in traditional things, such as accurate portrayal of anatomy or shading and value structure. When he uses paint, and the way he uses it, it's probably closer to how the German expressionists use paint as a way to portray feelings and or emotions, especially those that are unsettling or violent. The symbols Bacon uses in many of his paintings speak to some of his unease or violence. Doing an iconographic analysis of Bacon's paintings, one can see that he is clearly referencing art historical sources. But he uses the symbols in a kind of reversal or reinterpretation of them. It's very possible that Bacon is referencing his own sexuality and his particular proclivity towards rough gay sex that included vi fairly violent fantasies acted out by his so-called rough trade partners. Another um, strong influence on his iconography and imagery is that he collected medical journals and was very interested in 19th century scientific photographers such as Edward Muybridge. Probably pronounced Muybridge? I don't know. In, in one documentary, Bacon talked extensively about the imagery in some of the 19th century dental journals that showed the mouths being held open by medical instruments. This is directly referenced in the mouths of many of his paintings. Uh, in the documentary, Bacon talked about his fascination with these images, and he found the flesh of the open mouths beautiful and sensuous. And he, it's, it's really creepy to watch him talk about it because he's kind of drunk. He goes, oh, I really like the flesh of the mouth and the pink of it. So he's a bizarre character. The... <clears throat> the most popular interpretations of Bacon's series of Pope paintings after Velazquez are that they're an expression of the authoritarianism of the Catholic Church and possibly how the Church might have viewed his sexual orientation and his proclivities. However, he seems to have never made a definitive statement as to what he intended them to mean. The facts are as follows. He collected art books and medical journals that he used as reference material. He began painting his popes in 1946 and stopped painting them in the mid-1960s and even called the series silly. Although he's known to own many reproductions of Velazquez's painting of Pope Innocent, historians often comment on the fact that he did not see the painting in 1954 when he visited Rome for the first time. When you research Bacon's work, many of the scholars who write about him interpret the work often included, I, I suppose they include their own baggage or ideas, their interpretations, and they often make connections and leaps to film references and imagery they assume Bacon would have known. <clears throat> it's not necessarily the facts. In keeping with the Dada and Surrealist notions that their paintings came directly from their own unconscious and dream state, Bacon's works are perfectly aligned in their mission. However, it's possible that the interpretations of the works they were meant to model on are points of departure for the audience viewing them. Bacon might not have had a conscious intention of what he meant 
them to mean. 